playing music with people is a fascinating thing. I never get bored of of the process because it's so deep. There there are only a few places in life where you people really kind of are are expressing their inner souls. I guess is the way to put it. it. Sounds kind of strange to say that, but that's really what happens in music. And so when you play with somebody, you're you're interacting with them on this very deep level. It's something similar happens in conversation, but not always. In music, it's kind of amplified. So each person you play with, you know, is is a different experience, and there's some similarities, and um, you know, continuing the analogy with conversation, you're always going to be speaking about uh, things that you have in common. You know, it, I, I know nothing about chemical engineering, so if I'm talking to a chem chemical engineer, they're not going to be able to use a lot of jargon from that world. And in music, it's the same, there's a similar kind of process that happens. So if I'm playing with somebody who has a jazz background, there's certain references we can make together that, you know, are going to make sense. Whereas if I play with somebody who has a classical background or a folk background, there's going to be kind of a different set of references. But it's even a little bit more complex than that. That makes it sound a little simpler than it is. It's really kind of this rich mix of kind of um, hard to pin down uh, set of possibilities. And when you first start working with somebody, there's always, um, there's always this process of kind of finding that, that particular avenue and with some people, it's more challenging than, than others. Playing with Michael Hedges was just a dream. It was just a blast from, <laughs> from the first note to the last. Um, part of it was that we shared a lot of musical interests and kind of a strange set of musical interests. We were both uh, fascinated by um, contemporary music. So we shared a love for the you know, second Viennese school, you know, uh, Berg and Weber, and then uh, we both were passionate about the music of, of Morton Feldman, and we love Steve Reich music and Terry Riley's music. But we, you know, we're rock and rollers. You know, we love Hendrix and Van Halen and uh, that music. We liked a lot of folk music, and we, you know, both really loved what what Joni Mitchell and Jocko did together. And, that was always a reference for us. We often thought a lot about what they did and, and um, how we could move further in that direction, like as, as if they had you know, just kind of opened a door and we went into the room and, and started to explore what else was in that room. But it was always just uh, so easy playing with Michael. I think, I think a lot of it might have been because he was such a great listener. He really heard music very deeply. Again, it's kind of a hard thing to describe. A lot of things in music are really hard to put into words. But he really listened to music very intently. He was an excellent uh, academic musician. He knew a ton about music. He knew everything about music and had studied a massive amount of music. But at the same time, he had this very deep, visceral relationship with music. And any time music was playing or he was playing music, he just put all of himself into it. And so anything I would do, he would react to in some way. And he was one of those wonderful musicians. We just, you know, so appreciate these people, you know, who make you sound better <laughs> because he had that magical ability to kind of react to what you're doing and, and make it make sense. And it's kind of hard to, to describe how that would happen, but it was just always such a pleasure. And, and um, whenever we sat down to play, it, we would always go into this deep space right away. It was almost like meditative. Even if we were playing something kind of silly, we just really get into that deep space. And so that, that really made it a joy. I mean, we had a connection possibly a deeper connection than any connection I've had with any other musician at some, some levels. Um, our friendship was very deep. I think our, you know, our relationship was almost more friendship than musical interaction in some ways. And I think that really helped a lot. Um, but that, that was, um, 
It was a wonderful thing. Michael also, also liked to take huge chances. He never played something exactly the same way twice. And um, he, in many ways, was, was fearless. So it was, you know, often the case that he would just, in the middle of the show, he would just go off in some completely other direction, which I find, found thrilling. Uh, partly because he was such a good musician that if I just did nothing, he would do, do something that would sound good. But, you know, he always made a space for me to interact and, and go there with him. So we might be playing one of his ballads and suddenly that night it would become a reggae tune. And who knows, maybe the next night we'd do the same thing or try the same thing, and, but probably not. <laughs> and, you know, maybe we'd try it and we'd go off someplace else and... Um, but there were just always things like that happening that kept the music really interesting and kept us engaged. And um, he had this wonderful way about him of, um, as I w was saying, being very deep, this real deep uh, connection with music, both intellectually and, and viscerally, uh, physically and emotionally. At the same time, I had, you know, at the self same time had this real sense of fun and um, had an amazing sense of humor and that always makes it makes it thrilling to play with somebody that is able to bring that into music and the combination is especially effective so yeah it was a that was a very special thing I've played with a couple acoustic guitar players that had some of that same feeling he had. He had a very specific rhythmic feeling. It was very easy to play with, but it was very specific. Um, but everybody's different, and, and uh, I, I still enjoy playing in, in different ways, but the, the connection with, with Michael was, was a special one. Yeah, you know, I often think about what Michael would be doing today. Um, he was always full of surprises. He never quite knew what he was going to do. I, he sp would spend a lot of time away from the guitar. Often I, I wouldn't see him for a couple months because I was uh, touring with a lot of other people and doing a lot of other things when, when uh, he was alive. And so we maybe wouldn't play together for six months and then I'd, I'd go up to his place and we'd do a little playing together. And several times I did that and he would not have played the guitar in that entire time. So he would be off in some other, other space thinking about other things. So it's possible he would have moved further away from the guitar. Right? It's, it's, he, it's kind of unfortunate that, that we lost him when he did because he was right on the edge of some, some interesting breakthroughs. He, um, as a young guy, he had wanted to play jazz guitar. His, uh, Pat, Mo Pat Motino is a hero of his, as it is for almost any jazz guitar player. He's an amazing player. And he wanted to play like Pat, but couldn't do it. He just didn't, he had, it's odd, he had all the, the intelligence that you need to play that way. Um, and he had a lot of the chops, in fact, to play that way. But somehow he just couldn't put it together and just never worked. And so he went and developed this whole other amazing thing instead, which I always thought was a really amazing uh, way of dealing with a problem to completely reframe it. But um, later in life, he studied with Pat. And um, just when he died, he was starting to be able to play that way. And when I would go up and play with him, he would always get out the electric guitar and play in these other things. He was playing more and more electric guitar. And um, we were talking about possibilities that we could do with, with that kind of approach. And um, for a long time, he, he had um, hurt his hands a little bit, actually recording aerial boundaries. He had um, hurt his hands a little bit playing in that style. And so he was kind of toying with the idea of, of re kind of going back into that style a little bit more deeply and seeing what he could come up with at that, which I think would have been a thrill to hear. 
So it's really hard to say what he would be doing now. I, it's amazing how much I hear his influence in the guitar world. In fact, sometimes I think he may be one of the most influential musicians in recent memory um, because I hear so much of stuff that he really invented um, in other people. But I, I don't think he would have, I'm not sure he would have liked that. I know sometimes when people came backstage and played his tunes for him, he, um, he would get uncomfortable with that. Um, he was a very sweet person and a gracious person, but I could see that you know, his, he'd kind of get itchy and, and he'd want to be polite, but he'd really kind of want to leave at the same time. So I don't know how, how much he would would like to see how influential he's become. Um, he loved pop music, and he always wanted to be a rock star. He really wanted to be a rock star. So he might have tried to move more in that direction. And that's the exciting thing about him. He also, um, he was a very uh, skilled composer and had studied, um, you know, essentially what we'll call in the vernacular classical music composition. And he might have gone that direction. He might have kind of moved away from, from writing for the guitar and, and written, gone back to writing more for orchestra, for electronic music, or some combination of uh, musics like that. Um, he was a huge fan and a friend of uh, Frank Zappa. He loved Zappa's. He was around Zappa a lot when Zappa was writing his last music, the civilization music. And he might have gone in that kind of direction, where he's writing very complex music that was very electronic. So really, it's really hard to say where he might have gone with all this. And um, whatever it was, it would have been interesting and, and funny and engaging and um, and something worth seeing. A, a big thing about Michael is he was very, you know, he was an individual and it was very important to him to, to be honest musically. I, I, I'm not sure I ever saw him be dishonest musically. It may sound like a strange thing to say, but um, maybe once or twice he would try, but um, he was extremely passionate about music. You know, it was, music was so important to him, such a powerful part of his life. And he, he really needed to bring himself into the music. Um, and this really transcended the guitar. Um, he would have given up the guitar in a heartbeat if it didn't fit his musical needs. He was not, um, you know, married to the guitar in any sense. The guitar was a very effective tool for him, but if his, you know, if his musical needs shifted to another place, he would gladly put it down. Um, but it was very important to him to, to bring, you know, all of himself to the music making process. And the guitar was a very effective tool for him to do that. Um, and I think anybody else wanting to do that, I, I, I think it, um, it's probably important to understand that one way of looking at, at what Michael did was that he was combining his influences on the guitar. So what he was doing was kind of a combination of Bartok and Joni Mitchell and Ian Anderson, <laughs> all on the guitar, and Jethro Tull. You know, that one, he was kind of putting that all together. And in many cases, literally so. One of his pieces is um, the guitar is tuned to a chord from one of the Bartok piano concertos or something, I forget what it was. So often, you know, there'll be a literal usage in there of, of that kind of music. 
So um, a lot of what he was borrowing from wasn't necessarily guitar. You know, it was things that he loved that he was he was trying to put out there. And I think, you know, if you're interested in, in that kind of approach that he had, that would be the essential thing to understand, that it's this kind of honesty you have to bring to the process. And I don't mean, it sounds corny, but there's a love. You know, it has to always be about the love. You have to be able to separate the kind of desire to satisfy your ego. You have to be able to kind of separate that out from the things that you really love. It's not really about ego, but it's what you really love. And it's not that you have to throw the ego part away, because certainly Michael didn't, wasn't interested in throwing the ego part away, but he was very clear on, on um, understanding the difference between those two and how they can, and how we could integrate them in, in really powerful ways. I hope that makes sense.